Good morning. I greet you in the name of our Savior Jesus on this wonderful day that God has given to us that we can be gathered here in his house around his word and sacrament ready to receive his Easter blessings before we start having an ice storm. Are they, are they still saying ice tonight? You freezing rain? Okay. We'll see. You know how often they're wrong. Um, but anyway, um, so when it comes to announcements, if you look at whatever color they are this week, uh, just a few things. We are having a voters meeting next week. After this service, the main discussion is going to be the approval of the budget for 2024, okay? So uh, we hope that uh, you'll be able to be here for that. This Tuesday, assuming we're not all covered in ice, this Tuesday at my house, 7 o'clock, episode 8 of The Chosen, Watch The Chosen with the Pastor. We'll be finishing up season 1 this Tuesday night. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. Um, we are still needing pictures for the pictorial directory. Uh, the LWML is going to be sponsoring a, uh, now I can say this because this is not what's trademarked, a Super Bowl with, an, with a U, in, with an OU in there. Um, on February 4th and again on the 11th, you'll have a chance to vote for your, your favorite team with your favorite canned soup. Okay, so, and uh, just like in Chicago, you can vote early and vote often. So, you have that opportunity. Um, Okay, then uh, Wednesday night we're going to have uh, F3 again. It'll be uh, dinner at 6, chilly this week, uh, and then uh, classes at 7, okay? And uh, uh, one more reminder, well, I shouldn't say one more, another reminder that uh, uh, there is that trademark that the NFL has that we can't print and shouldn't say without getting their lawyers on us, but the big game on February 11th, you know, it's a week later now because they added a week to the season last year, um, you know, the, the youth is going to do sandwiches that you can buy as a fundraiser, and uh, so uh, the order form for that is in your bulletin as well. Uh, anything I am forgetting or neglecting? Yes, ma'am. We are having our second annual Valentine's Day benefit February 4th in Green Cloud. It'll be located in House Okay, anything else? All right, so one birthday tomorrow. Marguerite Blasfeld has a birthday. So, uh, oh, wait a minute. Our Germans are here today. Monica, how do you say happy birthday? Yeah, I can't do that. Happy birthday, Marguerite, if you're watching online. Uh, I know Froelich of Einachten, but I don't know that one. Okay. Okay, well, I can't do that either. So... <laughs> Anyway, um, all right, so let's go to our first song here this morning, which is You're Worthy of My Praise, and God uh, bless our worship this morning.
the congregation will please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, but with you there is forgiveness. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your punishment now and forever. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter suffering and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for our next song.
Continue with the readings. The Old Testament reading is from Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise the Lord, all nations. For great is his steadfast love toward us. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none and those, those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The congregation will now stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. We now confess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. 
and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being in one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, when it's incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated for our guest song of the week. You may recall here in the month of January, we're kind of doing some golden oldies for our songs before the sermon. We definitely have a classic one today. See, if you remember here 20 years ago, now you'd want to say, and all God's people said.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text for your sermon this morning, the biblical basis for our thoughts together here today, are the words of the Old Testament reading, which Mary read a few moments ago. Basically, Jonah chapter 3. So, I guess I forgot to mention this during the announcements. Today is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And so, we take one Sunday a year at least, and we address the the life issues that are going on in our society and our culture. And so, we are talking about that today. And so, with that in mind, we begin with this. Have you ever been somewhere where the folks you are with ask your opinion, you state your opinion, and then your opinion, your idea, your wishes are completely ignored. That ever happen? Maybe you're with family, family get together, and someone in the family says, what does everybody want for dinner? And you say what you want, and everybody completely ignores what you just said. This kind of happens at our house, because every time I say, what do you guys want for dinner, every time Christopher says, spaghetti, that gets a little old after a while. Uh, You're at a sales strategy meeting, and one of the people there says, "Uh, need some ideas, and so you give yours, and it is either rebuffed or ignored. That's not fun, right? If you feel like someone who is often ignored, if you feel like you don't matter, I have good news for you. You matter. You matter. Unless you are multiplied by the speed of light squared, then you energy. That actually went better. That really went better than I thought it would. Thank you for that. I I was really proud of that one. Little uh, theory of relativity humor. Sorry. Anyway, when people ignore us repeatedly, that's hard to forgive, right? That makes us mad. Well, Jesus obviously said we are to forgive each other. And how easy is it for you to forgive someone who has ignored you, someone who has hurt you, just one person? Can you forgive a whole family of people that has hurt you or uh, ignored you? Can you forgive an entire city? Or what about an entire country? Sin, repentance, forgiveness, these are not trivial issues for us Christians. We must understand and deal with these things. But we do so from the perspective of the good news, which tells us our forgiveness is not found in our ability to repent, but in God's willingness to relent, to forgive for the sake of Jesus. So I will warn you up front, our key word today from Jonah is the word relent. And so today we're talking about our relenting God. All right. So let's go back to Jonah. Jonah is told to go to Nineveh. And in Nineveh we saw God being relenting, forgiving. We see that in action. Now Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And I'm guessing you don't know a lot of things about Assyria, which is why I'm here to tell you, that the Assyrians were the nastiest, most vicious superpower of Old Testament times. It can be argued, realistically argued, that the Assyrians were the nastiest, most vicious empire of all time. At first service, there were a couple of things I was going to say, but there were young ears here. Everybody, there's, there's nobody under junior high age here, right? Except for Ezra. I don't think Ezra's going to care. Okay. So some, example, some examples of what I'm talking about, how nasty the, the Assyrians were. They have dug around where the Assyrian Empire was, and on street corners, they piled up in pyramids human skulls of the people they had killed in battle and in jail and in torture. And another thing they did, and this is the gross one, but we have found this. We know this to be true. This is not an exaggeration. I'm not making this up. When they would go into battle, when they would go out and, and, and kill some people or torture some people, they would skin them and they would take the people's skins and use them as wallpaper in their temples. All right. When I'm telling you the Assyrians were nasty, they were nasty. Okay. So, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. 
And the book of Jonah does not tell us how evil Assyria was, but the prophet Nahum does. And he gives us a bleak picture. In Nahum chapter 3, verse 1, about Nineveh, Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. And remember that quote, we're going to come back to that later. And Nahum also wrote about hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. This, now you might be thinking this is biblical hyperbole. It's not hyperbole. That's how nasty the Assyrians were. And Jonah wants God to wipe all those people out. Jonah wants God to kill them. Jonah calls for turning off the Assyrians' life support. Clearly the Ninevites were a mistake. They are unfortunate and unwanted. One way or another, Jonah wants to see the Ninevites euthanized. And since this is Life Sunday, those last few sentences, I picked that vocabulary very specifically because those are the sorts of words that people use for euthanasia and abortion. You see, their continued existence, the Ninevites, the Assyrians, makes Jonah uncomfortable. And Jonah was told by God to go to Nineveh, but Jonah didn't want to go. Now, I'm assuming everybody here is familiar with what the book of Jonah tells us, but just in case you're not, uh, it's pretty simple. Jonah was a prophet of God. He's in Israel. We'll say that Israel is like right here where my left hand is. And God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. Now, I say, I got to do this to your perspective, not mine. So Nineveh was like over here, all right? And when God calls Jonah and says, I want you to go to Nineveh, instead of going here, he goes here to a place called Tarshish. All right? So um, it would be, uh, yeah, so instead of going to basically Iraq, uh, Iran over here, he goes to Spain, the exact opposite direction. And Nineveh was the last place he wanted to go. And I can understand Jonah's reluctance because if the Missouri Synod folks up in St. Louis called me up and said, we want you to go to Pyongyang, North Korea, or we want you to go to Kabul or Tehran, that would be about the same thing. And Jonah didn't want to save those people. I actually would like to save the people in Pyongyang or Kabul or Tehran, but I don't know how long I would be allowed to try to do that before I would be taken out if I was to go there. Right? But Jonah didn't want to save those people. They were the enemy. And instead he went in the exact opposite direction, as you know, probably. Got on a boat. Boat got hit by a storm. Jonah said, you know, we're all going to sink unless you throw me overboard. So they threw him overboard, and the storm stopped. And that is when he got swallowed by a great fish. That is what the Bible says. I know that you're probably thinking, I thought it was a whale. The Bible, there's not a single English translation that I have seen that translates the Hebrew word dog, and yes, it's the Hebrew word dog, D-A-G, that is translated a great fish. It's a fish. Okay. So he gets swallowed by a great fish, he gets burped up back on the beach, and then he went to Nineveh probably looking a little scary because, you know, he spent a few days in, in, in stomach acid, you know what I mean? So, you know, some of you folks like to wear those acid-washed jeans. Well, he was an acid-washed prophet. Okay. So, he gets to Nineveh and he preaches the sermon that God told him to preach. And it was kind of a short sermon. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Amen. That's the whole sermon. Eight words. Now, I don't know if you came here on a Sunday, if I said an eight-word sermon and said amen, I don't know if you'd be happy with that or not. <laughs> well, it's too late now. We're way past uh, eight words. Um, the, I think the shortest sermon that I've ever done is eight minutes on a Sunday. I think that was the shortest one. And uh, I can tell you that when I am working on my sermon on a given week and I'm having a hard time trying to figure out what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it, I call this wrestling with the sermon. Sometimes when I tell Erica on Wednesday or Thursday I'm still wrestling, she just looks at me, my, my sweet supportive wife, she says, just get up and say, Jesus loves you, amen. 
but I don't know if that, that, that would go over well. Unless, especially here at second service, if you're really hungry and you want to beat the Baptists to IHOP or Jimmy's Egg, maybe you would want a eight-word sermon. I don't know, but it won't be happening anytime soon. But anyway, Jonah was happy to preach this eight-word sermon because he figured they were going to completely ignore it. He then left Nineveh, found a hill outside of Nineveh, he sat down on the hill hoping for the worst because Jonah was rooting for God to wipe out Nineveh like he wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah. So there's Jonah. He's sitting outside of town. He's under a shade tree. He has a picnic lunch, and he's just waiting for the show to start, waiting for God to kill them all. And this is really, you know, this is wrong, you know. This would be a modern equivalent, and this isn't the best illustration, but if you know anyone that goes to NASCAR races or watches NASCAR races, hoping there'll be lots of wrecks, okay? Jonah wanted to see everybody killed. And Jonah did not get what he wanted. The Word of God worked. The people believed God. God convicted them of their sin and gave them repentant hearts. The king of Nineveh himself, now this is not in the reading, it's in the verses that were skipped there, but this, this is the way the pericope was set up by, by the church. The king of Nineveh himself got into the act and commanded everyone to show signs of repentance, which is to, wear, to fast, not eat, and wear sackcloth, which was kind of like a potato sack, if you're old enough to remember those. And he even, the king even commanded this be done for the animals, so all the cows had sackcloth put on them, and no cows got grass for a while. Even the cows fasted. Because the king said, and this is in verse 9, who knows, God may turn and relent. And if you're not entirely sure what that word relent means, uh, a good definition for relent is to change your mind. Okay. And God did relent. God did change his mind. Verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. And that made Joshua mad, but that's another story. God looked ahead to that awful, wonderful Good Friday, and in his mercy, for the sake of that coming sacrifice of Jesus, he relented of the disaster he planned for Nineveh. That bloody city all full of lies and plunder and corpses, was spared from what it really deserved. And if you're wondering, did it stick? No. They didn't stay repentant and they went back to their ways. Now, today is Life Sunday. And so we talked about, talk about the sanctity of human life and that life is a gift from God. Okay? And what I'm about to say may not sit well with some of you, but it is the truth and it is truth that we need to talk about in our churches, especially on this uh, day before the 45th anniversary of the Supreme Court ruling of Roe versus Wade, a decision that legalized abortion nationally. Now, I know that that decision was reversed. It'll be two years here in June. But I have to tell you, from my perspective, I don't think much has changed. Yes, it is true that it is no longer a federal law that anyone could go anywhere in this country and get an abortion. But at the same time, and this is according to my research, and I realize that I may have missed something here, so if I, I did and, and you know something I don't, you can tell me after church. But in my research, there have been seven states that have had referendums about abortion since Roe v. Wade was overturned, and all seven states voted for abortion, including our friends here in Kansas. So whether you're comfortable hearing it or not, the truth is that abortion has made this country a bloody country all full of lies and plunder. Nahum's quote about Nineveh can apply to the United States. And like Nineveh, we need a relenting, a forgiving God. Abortion is a procedure that some say is carried out over 3,000 times a day in this country. It is hard to find accurate numbers. The CDC reported that there were 620,000 and change legal abortions nationally in 2020. That's the last year I could find. That's 1,700 a day, not 3,000. I think the CDC is probably low. but Between 1970 and 2014, the CDC reported there were nearly 44.5 million legal abortions. That's an average of more than a million a year. 
The company that does the most abortions is Planned Parenthood. There's one in Edmond. The most recent figures I found for them were that Planned Parenthood performed 374,000 abortions and change. 374,000 in 2020, 2021, that fiscal year. Now these numbers come from their reports, and I would also wager they're low, but this leads me to my next thought. Our country is full of lies when it comes to the issue of abortion. Every day, thousands of vulnerable women who have an unexpected or unwanted pregnancy are told the lies. They are told, abortion is your only choice. That's a lie. There are other life-affirming choices and thousands of people, hopefully millions, ready to support those women, those moms, in those choices. Women in that position are sometimes told, often told, don't worry, it won't hurt much. That's another lie. And if you have ever read the memoir or seen the movie Unplanned, you know that abortion hurts physically, emotionally, and spiritually. The biggest abortion clinic in Ohio did a billboard campaign a few years ago. And I just loved these, these signs they came up with, and I'm being sarcastic, please note. So some of their slogans said, Abortion is liberty. Abortion is a blessing. Abortion is sacred. Those are all lies, of course. And then there's the lie, it'll all be over soon. And that's the deadliest lie because an abortion affects people for the rest of their lives. If we're going to change things out there in society regarding the God-given value of human life, then we need to change things in here first, in our own hearts, and then we can do so in others. Because science makes it very clear that babies are people from the moment of conception. But God's Word reveals that they are much more than that. God formed every human being with His hands. Jesus died on the cross and rose again for every human being. God desires to call every human being into an eternal relationship with Him. And so we need to tell people that they matter. You matter. They matter. Moms matter. More and more in our society, the idea is spreading out there that we don't matter, that we're here by accident. There's no meaning to life. There's nothing that happens after this life, and therefore there is no hope. I have told you this before. I will tell you again. I believe, I can't prove this, but I believe that the reason we're seeing more and more school shootings and mass shootings and all this stuff is because this idea that you're here by accident, uh, the, you're, you're, you know, there's no uh, uh, supreme power, no God, uh, there's no hope, everything happens at random by accident, when you die, that's it. That idea has been taught in our culture, in our schools, um, and so forth now for 50 years. And as it's taking root, we have more and more people who think, you're right, there is no hope, there is no meaning to life, nothing matters, and then they go out and do these things. I saw on the news this morning that some guy was arrested in New York uh, he killed or stabbed anyway six people at random. He just said, I'm just going to go stab some people for no reason. I think that's why. But there is hope. We all do matter. We are here created by God and we're here by God's will to do God's will and join Him in heaven. And unborn babies are included in this. Our value as people comes from what God has done and not from anything we do. And that means these issues are way bigger than a societal issue or a political issue. It's a spiritual thing. Every life is, is, is valuable to God. Every life is valuable to God. Whether you live in a house or in a womb, whether you are up and walking around or confined to a wheelchair, whether you're making a name for yourself or no longer able to remember anybody's name. Every life is valuable. Therefore, as Christians, we are not for life and opposed to abortion because the children are precious. We are for life because the children are precious to God. We're not for life because we live in a society that isn't, but because we serve a God who is for life. And this means that speaking up for life, this is not an option for Christians. We are compelled to do so. We have to do it. And that is why I am preaching this sermon this morning. If you mention the topic of abortion in conversation with friends or co-workers, well, first of all, <laughs> good luck. 
But this is a topic that people feel strongly about on both sides. Well, God feels strongly about this too. Secondly, this is a topic for which many people have a lot to say. Well, we have something to say that's more powerful than Jonah's threats of disaster. In fact, the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us the most powerful, most positive, for-life message in the universe. This message of Jesus' death and resurrection for our forgiveness and salvation, victory over death, of hope in the midst of despair, of love for the vulnerable, of strength for the weak, and of good coming from suffering is tailor-made for the life issues. Indeed, it is the only message that can truly change hearts, minds, and lives. So how do we share that message? Well, first we need to educate ourselves on these issues and learn what God's Word says about them, which we're doing now. And then we can help places like Willow and Hope Pregnancy Center, which are two places in Edmond that try and counsel uh, gals that are having an unwanted or unexpected pregnancy to either keep the baby or give it up for adoption. And we can give witness to the value of human life in our daily walk as Christians. The life issues give opportunity not just to call wrong things wrong, but to share what our loving God has done about wrong things in His Son, Jesus Christ. We can speak of our God and His love for the weak and the helpless. We can speak of His love and healing for those hurting and despairing, and that includes ministering to moms. We can speak of our relenting God. We can speak of our forgiving God because we have a positive message for our neighbors and our country. Not a negative one. We're not called to say people are bad. We are called to say God is good. Okay, so we're way past eight minutes here, so I'm going to wrap up. It is sad to say, but because of abortion, we live in a country, a bloody country, full of lies and plunder. Again, Nahum's words about Nineveh. We live in a country that needs to repent and change. But the beginning of that change takes place in our hearts as we repent of our indifference toward the God-given value of human life. So armed with the gospel of Jesus, the most powerful for life message in the universe, we can be God's instruments in changing people's hearts and minds. So together, my brothers and sisters in Christ, let's help make that person, let's help make that happen. One person one heart, one mind at a time. In the name of Jesus, amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding may keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Heavenly Father, please bless and receive these gifts which we give back to you from that which you have first given to us. Amen. We now stand for the prayers and petitions of our congregation. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you desire not the death of a sinner, but that all would repent and believe the gospel. In the epiphany of your Son, your time of salvation and your kingdom have come near. As time passes, give faithfulness and urgency to your church to proclaim the gospel of our God to all people. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of the harvest, as you called Simon Peter and Andrew, James and John to follow you and made them fishers of men, so send faithful preachers of your gospel in our time. Lead us all to recognize that life is your gift and that we should honor that always. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, preserve our nation with its rulers. Call to repentance those who have forgotten you. Spare Joseph, our president, Kevin, our governor, and all who serve for the good of this people. Protect our troops, including Thomas, Matthew, Evan, and Cannon, Chris, Maya, John, and Ben, Debbie, Seth, Christian, and Jacob, Jonathan, Nick, Hyojin, Preston, and Tyler. Do not let disaster befall us. 
but preserve us in peace and quietness. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, turn us from every distracting anxiety in the dealings of this world that would draw our hearts away from your blessed gospel and its end, eternal life. Give us confidence in the resurrection and the peace of a clean conscience by the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. Graciously behold and help for those for whom we pray, and that includes those who are printed out in our bulletin insert here this morning. We add to that list prayers of comfort for Ann Houston as her husband Ron was called to his eternal home this past week. And we also pray for Trey Rudat, who will be in the hospital this week for tests. We now take a moment and uh, silently pray in our hearts for all those that we know to be in need of the grace, the mercy, and the presence of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, in your holy sacrament, you deliver the gospel pro pro proclaimed by your Son and won by his death in his true body and blood. Work repentance and faith in all who commune and unite us in a sincere confession of your divine truth at this altar. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. As the glory of your presence once filled your ancient temple, so in the incarnation of your Son, Jesus, you manifested the fullness of your glory in human flesh. We give you thanks that in his most holy supper you reveal your glory to us. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, so that we may one day behold your glory face to face. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The feast of the Lord is now prepared for the people of the Lord. Come to the feast.
stand for prayer. We pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. We remain standing for our closing song, Christ is Risen. Ah! 
God's people said, I thank you very much for joining us here this morning. Uh, have fun with any ice that may happen uh, tonight. We'll see what happens there. And otherwise, God be with you and bless you this day and this week.